Welcome to this episode of the Planning Podcast from Number 5 Chambers. Today I'm joined by Jack Smythe, Planning and Environmental Barrister at Number 5 Chambers, who's going to take us through the case of Hertfordshire County Council and others, and the Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, who weren't actually fighting each other. They agreed. They wanted a declaration to help us solve the conundrum which has been bothering many in the professions as to what happens next when the flexibility regs and their sunset clause finally set and we don't really know whether remote hearings can continue. You'll have seen via social media, via the press, that the court has determined this issue but the reasoning behind it is pretty important and the extent to which the case doesn't decide the main event is important and so the consequences are likewise important and it's to those practical matters that we're going to turn in due course with Jack. Hi Jack, how's it going? Very well Richard, thank you. Good to see you. Now, what was it that the High Court was being asked to do? It was being asked to declare something. What, what was that all about? Until Covid came along, as we all know, local authorities by long-established custom and practice conducted their meetings in person. By that I mean with the participants gathering to meet face-to-face at a designated physical location, with the members of the public coming to the very same location. And for those of you with an interest in the law, that is governed by Schedule 12 of the Local Government Act 1972. And on the 1st of April last year, the government introduced the flexibility regulations which allowed local authority meetings to be held remotely. But there's a sunset clause, and so the power expires on the 7th of May. Um, The Secretary of State has declined to provide primary legislation to extend them because they don't have the legislative time to do so. So therefore, there's a period of time between the 7th of May and sometime towards the end of June when there's the final expected lifting of the social distancing restrictions when it would appear that councils are unable to use virtual meetings. Or in fact to to meet at all because they're they're stuck between a rock and a hard place uh, after the 7th of May no virtual but until restrictions sufficiently lifted can't get together for a meeting in a, a physical place that's that's the problem. That's a real problem and it's compounded by the demographics because we all know that a disproportionate number of people, the councillors who sit on the planning committee are over 60 and they're older. vulnerable. Older is what you were yes. trying to say. Yeah. Yes. And, and you're entitled to say that because the High Court said it too. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we've got a question of interpretation. What was being said to the court and who was saying it? So basically, the claimants were inviting the court to read those bits of the 72 Act in a broad rather than a narrow way. And the case centres around particular phrases. So one phrase is meeting. And so the court was invited to read that as not limited to the meeting of persons all in the same physical space. Um, The term place, the court was invited to read that word as including reference to more than one place. So people could be electronically, digitally, or in virtual locations, um, or at different web addresses, or sat physically in different locations, communicating by video conferencing platforms or by telephone numbers. And the other term which preoccupied the court was the expression to be present. What does that mean? And the court was invited by the claimants to read the word present to mean including those attending or participating by an electronic means, by telephone, webcast or virtual streaming. It sounds like a well-being session where one is (laughs) always encouraged to be present. Yes. Anyway, back to the law. So Hertfordshire were in it. Secretary of State was in it. Were they at each other hammer and tongs? Um, Not at all. And and there was the Local Government Association as an interested party, and everyone was singing happily from the same hymn sheet. They were all inviting the court to make the declaration. The Secretary of State's position was a little different because he wanted, if you like, a skinny declaration so as not to tie his hands. But everyone effectively was 
speaking from the same hymn sheet. Because the, 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 the other claimants were coming along with something which was effectively a piece of legislation and asking the court to endorse that. But the Secretary of State was saying, no, we need to be much more cautious about the terms of any declaration. But everybody was saying, yes, can we have that declaration? But well, we'll see in due course. But what about Wales? Because does, does this affect Wales? I can put your mind entirely at rest, Richard. Both Scotland and Wales already have statutes explicitly or regulations explicitly providing for virtual meetings when the devolution settlement was brought about and subsequently developed. So this is very much an English problem. An English problem. The devolved administration's way ahead. And uh, that might be a topic to which we return in a podcast coming our way sometime soon. OK, so... Want to tell us just a little bit about what the arguments were? Presumably, if everybody was agreeing, there was, there was something in these arguments that everybody thought was worth agreeing on. Yes. So the key issue was the one of interpreting those particular phrases. And what the claimants were saying, what they were promoting, is what was characterised as an updating approach to statutory construction. So what it means is that when the 1972 Act was drafted, the scope of any kind of virtual meeting was highly constrained. So with the exception of the telephone, there was little scope for instantaneous electronic communication. And therefore, the court was invited to read into the Act those forms of communications which could not have been anticipated when the statute was put on the books when Ted Heath was Prime Minister. The purpose of the requirements in Schedule 12 was to enable members to consider and debate local authority business together and to make decisions about it. And therefore, it was said that the remote meetings are entirely consistent with that purpose. Interestingly, for those of us who have got a geeky preference um, when it comes to old cases, there was a rich scene of authorities which the claimants relied upon by way of analogy. And I'll give you two examples, Richard, because I know that you have an interest in 19th century law as much as I do. And um, the first case was the Attorney General and the Edison Telephone Company of London Limited, which even the name of the case gives a, a hint as to its age from 1880. And in that case, the Exchequer Division held that the telephone was a telegraph within the meaning of the Telegraph Act of 1863, even though the telephone had not been invented or even contemplated at that time. That's particularly apt, isn't it? Because the other phrase used for that way of construing legislation, the adapting idea, is the always speaking statute. And to have a case about a telephone being an always speaking statute seems spot on. So I don't know why they didn't buy it, but you're going to explain why they didn't buy it. <laughs> Go on, what was the other case? Yeah, the other case was the South London Coroner and Thompson in 1982. And that was, there was an, a requirement in the statute for a coroner to take notes of the evidence. That was the expression. And what had happened is the coroner had recorded, tape recorded the proceedings as is done in courts today. And the court found that tape recording satisfied that requirement to take notes of the evidence. Mm, okay. So court benevolent or not benevolent? Uh, court not benevolent. So whilst there was many arguments put forward in favour of that benevolent approach, the court rejected it effectively for two reasons. It found that the particular reference within Schedule 12 of the Act sat uncomfortably with the approach being promoted by the claimants. So the Act includes the obligations to hold a meeting at such a place either within or without the area and to publish a notice of the time and place of the intended meeting, and also to send a summons to attend the meeting. And in, their, in the court's view, all those expressions are most naturally interpreted as a reference to a particular geographical location, and would not naturally encompass an online location. Um, and that attending a meeting at a single specified geographical location would, in their view, ordinarily mean physically going to that location and therefore the expression to be present at such a meeting would involve physical presence at that particular location. The second reason why the High Court rejected the argument was perhaps less prosaic which is that meetings provided for by the Act are a very important part of the mechanism of how decisions are 
reached in this country, up and down the country, from tiny little parish councils in rural areas to conurbations like Birmingham, where I'm sat. Uh, and the decisions taken at those meetings may have significant legal consequences for third parties. And therefore, it makes it important to have certainty about what constitutes attendance or presence at a meeting. And without such certainty, it may be unclear whether a particular decision has been validly taken or not. And therefore, a construction according to which meetings have to take place in person at a physical location better promotes certainty than one in which remote meetings are permissible in some but not other situations. And the dividing line isn't clearly spelt out. So th- those are the two main reasons that we're taken to a conclusion which neither party, no party, was was contending for. That's kind of the outcome, isn't it? Nobody was contending for it, but the court came to its own conclusion on what the act meant. Yes. I mean, there's a very strong, pragmatic, if you want to use a slightly more, less favourable expression, expedient argument to allow the declaration because it would solve a lot of problems which everyone recognises do need to be addressed. But I think the court took what you might describe as a high-minded approach that straightforwardly they were not satisfied by the merits of the argument and therefore weren't willing to stretch the words beyond a meaning which they felt they could reasonably bear. But they, they also, on my reading, were keen to emphasise that there are a whole load of choices to be made, a whole load of choices as to what form of meeting was possible, desirable. And they, they had a look at what was happening in Scotland and in Wales and kind of came to the conclusion that this isn't our job to write the statute. Somebody else in Parliament needs to write that after they've had a chance to think about it carefully. And it's quite resonant, really, with what's being said about courts doing their job and Parliament doing its own. And the court here saying we're we're not getting involved. Yes, entirely. The the expression they often use over in America is legislating from the bench and judges being criticised for taking up the role of the legislative branch. And as you say, the court has been deliberately cautious at not intervening and effectively helping the Secretary of State out because the Secretary of State has refused to make or has demurred from making parliamentary time to fill the gap. And the declaration is effectively that bridge to cover that period. And the court said we're not prepared to read the legislation in such a benevolent way to help him out. And I have no idea whether this formed any part of the thinking. It probably didn't. But you can see that that it's consistent with the court on the one hand being perpetually told by government that uh, it must not, must not be uh, too involved or activist uh, or stepping into the shoes of Parliament, that's what is being told by the Lord Chancellor. And when the Secretary of State comes along and seeks some assistance in construing legislation in a way that suits the moment, the court says, well, actually, no, that's on your desk. Entirely. I'm sure the irony wasn't lost on the judges of the court that they were being asked to do what they're roundly criticised for doing most of the time. Yeah, it's a good example. Anyway, that was a bit of a bit of an excursion into another place. Let's have a look at whether or not this matters. Does it matter? Um, Yes, it may not matter quite as much as people think, but it does matter because the risk is if um, the councils during that sort of six to seven week period make decisions and the manner in which those decisions are reached is unlawful, then any of those decisions could then be adulterated with unlawfulness. And then the council could then have a lot of decisions potentially being quashed in the High Court. So that's the risk. And that's what councils are concerned about. What, what do you think, Jack, is going to happen practically here? Um, or what, what could one do practically? Yeah, well, one, one way to solve it would be for the government to set out clear guidance. And we did actually today get a letter from the minister, a very short letter about side of A4, imploring councils to return to -to face-to-face meetings from the 7th of May. But it lacks detail. It doesn't read to me like a technical note. It's little more than a general plea and has very little, has no legal effect. So it seems to me that 
absent any guidance from the minister, absent any guidance from the local government association, individual councils are having to scrabble around and try and make their own arrangements, temporary arrangements for that six to seven week period. And it seems to me there's three main options. So option one is you do what the minister says and return to -to face-to-face meetings. But of course, that presupposes you've got the physical facilities to do so. Second option, which has a certain uh, simple attraction to it, is simply defer decisions. Because if you're not obliged to have planning committee meetings every month, then you could simply delay it and perhaps book a mega session on the 1st of July to mop up any dis- all decisions which have been a- accumulated in that time. The third option, which is potentially the more legally complicated, is to delegate decision making during that seven week period to the chief executive and to avoid the risk of that being an unaccountable and undemocratic power grab, so to speak, or at least that's the way it could be presented. You could have the virtual meetings of the planning committee carrying on, then voting, and then that being a the vote then representing a recommendation to the chief executive. So in legal terms, that would be your material consideration, which the chief executive considers when he or she comes to make her decision. Mm. Well, there's a an interesting trio of options, each with their own advantages and disadvantages, and probably their own different attractions depending on the particular authority and the pressures that they're under and the facilities which they have. Uh, But Jack, that's fantastic to have those options set out so clearly. And there's obviously some way to go on this yet. And as you've pointed out, uh, we're receiving letters even during uh, the course of us recording this podcast. So thank you ever so much indeed. It's helped me a lot uh, in understanding what the problem is Uh, how we got here and what the remaining issues are. So thank you very much indeed. So we have the court's judgment on the question of meeting uh, and uh, being present, Uh, but the court handed down a supplementary judgment on the 4th of May, uh, which dealt with two ancillary questions. What does open to the public mean and what does held in public mean? Does it mean that a person wishing to attend a local authority meeting is entitled to do so? Well, the answer to that is, in essence, yes. However, this doesn't mean that local authorities are prevented from broadcasting or live streaming some or indeed all of its meetings. That's a separate question. And indeed, So too is the question of how many people, how many members of the public are able to attend, having regard to public health legislation and guidance. But what the short ancillary judgment does is say, consistent with the way in which the court explained what a meeting was, it's not enough just to provide the virtual real access to a real place is also necessary. So, an ever-moving story, this one, and there's the latest chapter. That was the planning podcast from Number 5 Chambers, which, over the course of the next few weeks, is going to turn to Wales. What's happening there? And how is it different to what's happening in England in the planning and environmental sphere? It's going to turn to the Oxford-Cambridge arc. What's happening there? What's not happening there? And what's in prospect? And the difficulties encountered by examinations, those examinations which seem to be never-ending, the very, very long examinations. We're looking forward to all of those podcasts and guests associated with them. But until then... Thank you for listening, stay safe, and goodbye.